afternoon. I think we're ready to start our workshop. All right. Um, I'm Rebecca Vandevoord. I am halftime special assistant to the provost and halftime associate director for academic outreach and innovation, which houses the global campus as well as academic media services, um, our e-learning services, <coughs> which is the portion of AOI that supports faculty in adopting innovative academic technologies to to, uh, I'm not, I don't like to say improve teaching, but to enhance teaching and learning. And we collaborate with the provost's office, which is easier this year since I'm in both places, and AOI and the Teaching Academy to produce this series of faculty-led workshops and appreciate attendance. I know there are some people here who come frequently to our workshops, and that's great. Uh, we also do archive them, put them up on the website, so that uh, even if you want to share with people who weren't able to make it today, they'll be able to see it in about a week or so. Um, so I am excited about this year's series, and I do want to say we actually have the whole year put together, and you can see that on the Teach site, teach.wsu.edu. Our next pre presenter will be, oh, I wrote the date, it's Bill Condon, and he's talking about creating rubrics, um, building rubrics from the ground up, and that is October 13th, next door. And beginning with that workshop, we will again be offering lunch. So uh, we do know that that does impact attend, uh, attendance and that many people are running from one thing to the next. And if we're gonna do this during the lunch hour, we really need to make sure people are fueled. So with that, our presenters today on the A game are Lisa Carloy from biology. Kurt Wilkie from Engineering, no? School of the Environment, sorry. And Aaron Welchel in Vancouver. And this is the first time we've had a speaker at a distance. And Aaron, which, which department are you in? I'm in history. History, okay, great. And so all three have been using the A-game. Um, you'll see they're actually featured on the back of the A-game. So they'd probably autograph your copies if you'd like. Uh, and who's starting? Aaron, okay, so take it away, Aaron. All right, well, great. Well, thank you for coming. Um, just to give a little bit of background on the A-game, uh, the book is written uh, by Dr. Kenneth Sufka and consists of nine rules plus some, uh, you know, an epilogue um, of student strategies for success in the classroom. Uh, Dr. Sufka covers everything from you know, what are good note-taking strategies while you're actually in class to how you should study outside of class, uh, what are some methods for maximizing your study time and your effectiveness. And so the book is, is relatively short. It's written to be, um, to be easily accessible, uh, and it's organized in a very straightforward kind of way. It's laid out in the nine rules. And... Uh, it's uh, something that a, a, someone could sit down and read in a half an hour, 45 minutes. We were provided on our, our campus uh, with this book last year, uh, and we were asked, and it was, it was distributed to our incoming students, uh, particularly uh, those going through our orientation program, uh, ROAR, uh, which occurs over the course of August. This was for both new freshmen and for transfer students. As an instructor of the Roots of Contemporary Issues course, uh, which is a UCOR requirement survey level course, uh, our anticipation was that many of the Roots students would receive this book. And as it's also an introductory course, it seemed appropriate to try to gather some data about how students were using the book, if they were using it, and uh, what problems that we might have that we can overcome in terms of increasing uh, student use of the, of the text. So I hope that you all have copies of the survey that we uh, uh, held last year in our Roots to Contemporary Issues courses. You'll, you should have two surveys. One is from our uh, transfer, our, our course for transfer students. That's History 305. 
and the other is a uh, combination of the results from sections one, two, and three of our 105 course, our um, freshman level uh, version of Roots of Contemporary Issues. We have uh, approximately, or had approximately, 230 or so students enrolled in across all of those sections. Of those, about half of them received the book as part of orientation. The survey was only given to those with the book. From those that received the book, we found that only half actually uh, read it at all. But what was interesting was that the vast majority of those students who did read it found it useful. Of those who read it, the number who found it uh, not useful were very small, uh, just, a, just a few percentage points. It's interesting that this data suggests that a couple of things. And the first is that there are some particular pieces of advice that they found uh, quite useful. Uh, the top one being uh, attending class, coming to class, being there every day, uh, trying their best to avoid uh, uh, missing it for, um, you know, uh, for any reason. Uh, Dr. Sufka is fairly strident on this point in the section on attending class, uh, talking about uh, the very few exceptions for why he might allow a student to be gone, including donating uh, kidneys and so forth. Um, Attending class was definitely the top one. Uh, sitting in front of the classroom was also uh, a suggestion that stood out to many students. And uh, we do see, uh, I can only speak anecdotally, but it does seem like those students who uh, have read and appreciated the text do tend to uh, sit as close as they can uh, and, per and definitely act like they're sitting in the front of the classroom. You know, not everyone can be in the front row, but, um, but as much as possible, they, they take on that um, attitude of sitting in the front row of the class. The last, uh, last tip that I thought stood out from the survey re results was studying more effectively, uh, particularly in uh, History 305 for transfer students. Uh, the book has several study tips sort of interspersed throughout the rules, so it's a bit hard to say which study tips they're finding most useful, and that is something that we would want to follow up on if we were to do this again. So those are some of the things that students found useful about the book. But the question becomes, how do we convince students that it's in their interest to take a, a, just a brief amount of time to read the book and think about how they can implement it, um, implement the suggestions in their own um, class time and study time. One problem that the survey suggested is that the book is perceived as being common knowledge. And I can see that criticism, particularly for students who may be transfer students and so forth, who feel like they have a lot of experience al already in the classroom. Uh, but I think that it's perhaps, uh, I think it, uh, students don't delve as deeply as they should. Uh, the book may appear as common knowledge, but there are very specific strategies within it that if they were implemented uh, could be very useful. So one of the challenges then is to communicate to students that while some of the general themes of the book seem fairly common sense, uh, there are specific things in there that could be very useful for them if they took the time to uh, read the text. Another challenge that we have uh, in our, in particularly in Vancouver's environment, but I imagine in Pullman's as well, is uh, first of all we have uh, students here at Vancouver who are, have had experience in the college environment before, sometimes leading to this idea that they've, they've, they know this stuff, it's, it's something that they've already picked up through their college career. Uh, but we also have students who are very, very busy, and to get them to do anything that's not absolutely required is uh, challenging, uh, not because they don't want to do it, but because they, uh, our students do lead, lead very, very busy lives, and so it's often a challenge for them merely to do what is expected from their regular coursework, let alone adding another text. So in in response to our survey results, uh, we've 
expand a little bit with what we're doing with the book in our Roots of Contemporary Issues courses this year. It's, we were already had uh, established in the course a series of workshop days where we work on writing skills, where we work on library research skills. And what we've done is added, the uh, we've, we've taken the rules, split them up among those workshop days, and now consider them uh, in those workshop days specifically uh, as part of our coursework. Uh, because the book is only distributed to new students, uh, it's not something that we can require them to read, uh, as some students aren't brand new and therefore don't have the book. But um, a lot of them do, and so and they also can uh, share it around, and there are, we have some copies on reserve in the library. So a lot of students are being exposed to Sufka through the book, but also uh, now we are covering it much more in depth in class. One of the things that we like to do is to make the um, make as many specific links uh, with what we're doing in Roots of Contemporary Issues at that time. So when we talk about the rules, we apply them specifically to how they help in our particular course. And one of the things that we found interesting about the book is that if instructors read it as well and take to heart the, the uh, tips, we can meet students halfway in getting some of them done. Uh, for instance, rule number six uh, discusses learning objectives. Well, we have uh, learning guides that go with each of our units that have the learning objectives broken down so that students can review those. We have learning objectives built into our library research assignments, as well as the sort of the more general learning objectives found in our syllabus. So that meets the student halfway. At that point, they don't have to start from scratch. They can take those learning objectives. And as Dr. Sufka discusses, uh, uh, sort of absorb them, encode them into their own latticework of how uh, they are approaching the course. And that helps them understand why they're doing a process and not just how to do that process. So I uh, thank you for letting me share those results of what we found here using the book at WSU Vancouver and hope to be able to answer some questions a little later. Well, Key, I'm an instructor with the School of the Environment. And to get us started with the A game, there's a little exercise I want to get you to do. And this deals with page 42, and I'll put it up on this. Yeah, maybe. There we go. And let's enlarge that a bit. Uh, didn't quite work. Okay, if you can turn to page 42, there's also a little handout then. Um, this is just to give you a, a basic idea of why it's important. Uh, the idea is that everyone has seen a penny. Uh, you have used it for your whole life, at daily almost, and do you really know what a penny looks like? And so just take a few seconds and look through the diagram and which one is the real penny? If you've done this before, then don't tell anyone else. But if you haven't, this is kind of a wake-up call. So which one is the real penny? What if you've done it and you can't remember? <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so let's take a few guess, guesses then. Anyone? I think it's either A or J, but I don't know if the liberty is on the left. OK. I, okay. Anyone else? How about some of the help? <laughs> so, this is something that you see day in, day out. And the actual answer is A. The point is that unless you make a concerted effort to think about it in put it into memory, and then be able to retrieve it, you're not able to pull that information out. And so that's the main idea, is that we have to organize the information in such a way that we can actually retrieve it. And so that's what the students are having problems with in many cases, is organizing their information and then trying to retrieve it. What I want to do is talk a little bit about how I use the book in the course. I got started using the A book, or the A game, 
because I'm involved with First Year Focus. So they actually used, last year was the first time that the book was given out to all incoming freshmen, or first year students, and it's been handed out again for this year. Uh, Geology 101 is the course I teach. It's a mixed course. I have about 70, per, 70 students who are actually first year students, and the remaining 165 are not, and so I have a mixed course. So I can't really require them to buy the book and then use it. But what I've tried to do is make a concerted effort that, for example, this year um, before my first quiz, I went over the A game, introduced it, the chapters, and said that many of the comments, as the survey noted, that these are common sense comments, but I just kind of read through them. Rule one, always go to class. Two, never sit in the cheap seats. One way that I use it is I have 240 students in the class. No, not everyone can sit in the front of it, but I walk around and up halfway up the aisles, and so there really isn't a bad seat in that respect. I also tell them they can't use cell phones. All computers have to be used in the first five or six rows. This way it cuts down on uh, clutter of things that keep them occupied on something else. When they're lost, ask questions. And then the fifth one, which is important, is get spaced out. In other words, don't wait until the last minute. And to study. And so those are the things I, I impressed on them. And for those students that didn't have the book, I encouraged all of them to read it. I have copies in both Terrell and Owen Science Libraries that they can actually read. And told them it was a quick read from that. The next point was that you have to make the studying something that works for your class. And about eight years ago, I wrote up a help document, which is on my course webpage, which is How to Study for Geology 101. And it utilizes many of the same techniques that um, Kenneth Sufka actually talks about in that. Part of mine is I do a study guide. It's up the first day of class. I try to get them to, instead of waiting until just before any quiz or exam, write out the questions and the answers as we're going through in other words, they're taking notes, they're reading their textbook, and I have online system that makes, or at least most of them are at least reading parts of their test textbook. And so if they do a little bit of the study guide after each one of these and then start to do the review process, they now start to process and make connections between different chapters, different information. And so those are the things that I'm trying to get the students to do. And after the first quiz, the scores were not the best, and so what I ended up doing was taking about 10 minutes, brought out the study guide, had the quizzes in front of me, said, if you look at yours, this question was on your quiz, this question was on your quiz, this question was on your quiz. 90% of that content was from their study guide. And so I tried to impress to them that use the study guide, use it early. If you have questions, you can always come and see me. If you have problems, I can help you with study methods. And so that's how I utilize the book. And I'll give everything over to Lisa. All right, let me get situated here. This one? Uh, the other one first, Lab Zero. That's it. All right, well, my name is Lisa Carloy, and I teach um, two courses in the fall, and I've used the book in both of them to very, in very different ways. But one is Science 101, which is a non-science majors course, and it's heavily populated by um, elementary education majors, and then it also has a, a number of students who are in the first year focus. And so um, I really like this year because many of my students are sophomores and freshmen, first year students, and so they, most of them have the book already. I do have some juniors um, who did not get a copy of the book, um, so next year I think everybody will have a copy of the book. But I really like this book a lot, and I, I read it and I saw that so many of the things he talks about are things that my students are doing wrong. And so I thought, you know, I don't know how many of them are going to actually read it, so I'm going to incorporate it into class so that it becomes part of our class content and part of our classroom activities. And I think what Aaron was saying that, you know, from his survey data, that a lot of the students, over half the students, simply said, oh, I don't have time to read another book. And they don't realize that it's not another book. It's just a really quick, short, 
short, you know, 35 minute time commitment to read it with lots of good ideas. So what I ended up doing was um, I thought, one of the things that I do in the very first week of classes, since I have a lab course and all the students are in lab and we can bring computers into the lab, I wanted to train the students on how to use Blackboard, how to access information from Blackboard and how to upload assignments onto Blackboard and, and really facilitate their becoming comfortable with that technology. Well, I needed something for them to access and upload so that they could practice and I thought, aha, Let's do something with the A game so that they have to read it in lab, fit, you know, access a homework assignment on it, a dummy right, homework assignment on it, and then upload it to submit it and turn it in. So it was a really nice uh, juxtaposition of training them on technology and training them on how to be a good student coming in. So what I ended up doing was I wrote, um, you can see on here, I, I have homework assignments, which I call learn before lecture worksheets, LBLs. And what they essentially are, are reading guides. So normally the reading comes from their textbook, but this time it came from the A game. And I, I asked our registrar if she could get me 22 copies of the A game so every student in class would have one, whether they own a copy or not. And she graciously sent me 23. And so I'm able to pass a book out to everybody. It's such a quick read. It takes about, I don't know, 20 minutes at the most for them to read the first four chapters and answer these simple basic questions and in basically saying, what does he say about this? What does he say about this? How will this be useful to you? And when I looked at the book, I, I, I think it's really nicely organized because the first four chapters are essentially how to be a good student, right? How to set yourself up for success in the classroom. These are rules about don't sit in the front row, always come prepared. Um, you know, learn a little all along. And these are the things students need to know from the get-go. The second set of chapters is really about how to take a test. And so I focused my, my first week assignment in lab on the first four chapters, how to be a good student. And so I created this homework assignment. I posted it on my Blackboard site. I had students come in the lab, download it, complete it, and then upload it and, and practice doing that. And then I had a chance to kind of look at what they said and see if they were actually engaging with it. So I thought that was very helpful. Um, but it is the first week, you know, and students are getting a lot of information at them the first week. So I wanted to revisit it again before the first exam. So um, actually it's this week. This week is the week before the first exam. So I, I kind of did a similar thing again, but rather than having it be a homework assignment, I just made it be the first 20 minutes of our lab that we're doing this week. And this time I had them, I picked two of the chapters um, that have to do with how to prepare yourself to take an exam and how to prepare yourself and learn the material well. And so I ended up choosing um, chapters five and seven. So chapter five is, you know, get spaced out. So start now and make sure that you're, you know, learning multiple sessions rather than one big long one. And then rule seven is learn material at all levels. And this is something that my students really struggle with. And I think the penny example is really great. It's not in the chapters that I chose, but I think it's really great because I think oftentimes you come to class, you do the homework, you feel like you know the material, but what you have is you have the material. You have it in your notebook. You have it you know, in your, in your homework that you've completed, but you don't have it in your mind, but you think that you have it in your mind. And so I think that it's really helpful to push it and say, well, do you know the details? Do you know where the date is? Do you know where, you know, where the, the liberty, the word liberty goes? Do you know if it says one cent or not? And so, so I point that one out to them, but then I focus on chapter seven, five and seven, because these are really good strategies for how to study and how to know what you know and how to figure out what you don't know and then how to focus on what you don't know and learn that better so that there's no surprises as you go. So my students are doing that this, this week actually in lab. We have an exam on Monday. After the exam, I'm gonna use it one more time for those students who score at the mean or below because the means on the first exam are typically pretty low, like in the 65, 68% range. And so for students who choose to take my offer, 
I offer them the opportunity to get up to 4% back on the exam by doing an exam autopsy. And an exam autopsy is um, basically a way for students to pause, look at what they did, think about how, you know, why they got the questions wrong that they got wrong, what strategies worked for them in approaching the exam, and what strategies did not work. And so that's what the second handout is there. And this is just a, a real quick one that I um, put together on the fly last year. But, but the first part of it is, you know, just being reflective and going through the material one more time. But then the very last thing I have them do is once they've gone through the content sorts of things, is I ask them to reflect on their own behavior and how they prepared for it. And the A game is great for that. So I have them go back into the A game and just read it and then tell me what deadly habits did they do and then think about what will you do differently to prepare for the next exam. And I can't, I don't have any data that is directly um, measuring how well the A game improves scores, but the exam autopsy as a whole, I went through and on average, students who did the exam autopsy, who you know, got fairly low scores on the first exam, on average, their scores improved by 7% on exam two. And that was pretty astounding. Some of them improved, you know, like 20%. Others, there were a few that went down. So it was, and those students tended to get, you know, like in the 40s or 50%. So they kind of had a long, I think, more things that they needed some, some help with than just study strategies. But, but I think it, it was really nice. I, I really like having this as a tool to help students think about what did I do, what didn't I do, what could I do differently, what did I think was working, maybe it didn't really work so well. So that's the, the way that I use it for, um, for my Science 101 students. Um, I also do point out, since so many of them are elementary ed majors, I, I, I point out to them at the end of, well, kind of at the end, that this is a really good tool for them as teachers, as well as being a good tool for them as students. So I think that, that if they all have a copy and hold on to it, it can help their own, their own um, strategizing or helping their students in the future. So then the last thing that I did with this book, since I also teach Biology 106, and this is a huge class with 538 students in it in Todd Auditorium, and um, I, I teach the second half. It's a team taught course, and so I don't have as much um, interaction with the students at the beginning. But I do have some interaction with our TAs, and I thought most of our students in that big of a class, they form a relationship with their TA much more than they form a relationship with us, the, the instructors, the two instructors. Um, and, and I know that as TAs, you know, TAs don't necessarily have training in thinking about if you're not being successful in the classroom, what can you do differently? Often people who are in graduate school were successful in the classroom, and so it can be a challenge to figure out what are you doing wrong or what can you do differently? And so I, again, asked our very helpful registrar. So Julia sent me enough copies to give to my graduate TAs for Biology 106. And so we gave them copies, asked them to read it, and then use this information to help the students at, as they start to come and ask for help as they prepare for exams or after the first exam. I think they may see more office hour activity. So I think it's really helpful to empower the TAs with some information about how students learn and how, how students are not studying correctly. Because I know when I first started teaching, I had a student, I was like, well, you know, here are the things you should, you know, are you sitting in a good seat? Are you studying and reading beforehand? And they're like, yes, 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 yes. And I'm like, well, then I don't know why you're not doing well. And I found for me, I mean, over the years, I've kind of figured it out, but I did find that Safka articulated what the problem is really well. And for me, reading him was helpful because it helped me sort of articulate what I was trying to, to say in a, a more eloquent way. So, um, so those are the ways that I've used the book and will continue to use the book. So I know there's not a large group here, but um, I wanted, we have some time for discussion. And we were gonna break you up into small groups, but we already are a small group. So um, I think Kurt and I and Aaron are all here to, to talk with you 
so if you have ideas or thoughts about the A game or using the A game or students' perceptions of the A game. And um, you will need to speak into the mic. We do have four people that we're streaming in from a distance. So also if they have questions, um, they can post those to Theron and he will report them here. Six, six people streaming in. Um, so comments? This isn't so much a question as sort of building off of what I, the ways in which I hear that you folks are using um, the book. I just this week have happened to have a couple conversations um, with GAs and with uh, a hall director about time management and, and trying to teach time management to staff, trying to teach time management with students and so on. And so the link uh, between spacing out your um, learning, partly that is because we do learn things better, and, and partly it is also that time management bit. And so it seems to me like the, the follow-up, especially maybe with first-year students, is not just, you know, yes, it's good to, to space out your learning, but how are you going to plan that into your day? When yeah. are you going to do that? And really think consciously about about what it takes to do what is really project management, you know, which is a skill you need your whole life. How do you space out a project in a way that it isn't always a crisis situation at the end? Because all of us do have things that happen last minute that we can't avoid happening last minute. So what are the things you can plan for so that your studying isn't that last minute thing? Um, so that, you know, that is spaced out, but that those are combined, that time management and, and, and spacing out your learning are one and the same, and it serves both for your mental and social and physical health, but also because that's how we learn, is that if you revisit material over time, that in fact, you won't have the crisis because you will have had, you will have built up that knowledge over time, and, and it's already there available to you to be able to use. Um, so uh, it, it just seems like maybe that's like just a further you know, sort of thinking about it is that not just spacing it out, but I mean, for example, um, it would be easy for, to provide like for first year focus people, because we have copies of them, you know, maps of what, is, what does a week look like? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. maybe that's a time to pass something like that out and say, so well, think about your week. When are you going to space out this learning so that you're not doing it all the night before the exam? Yeah, and actually that, I think that, I need to get a pencil and make some notes. I think that's a really good um, observation because waiting until the week before the exam to direct them to chapter seven it feels a little yeah. too late. Um, and yet I know that's the dynamic of, of you know, student life. Um, but the speaker, we had some speakers on campus here in Pullman um, last week and they talked about the idea of of spacing out your reading. And then they went on and said that it's not just, you don't want to just read and revisit your notes. You want to retrieve the information. And that's the key thing is that re repeated retrieval. And that's, I think, the piece that even students who think that they're studying a little all along are missing because they're reading and they may be rereading, but they're not doing the harder work of retrieving and forcing it out. And so, um, so I think that's a good point to, you know, maybe do some chapter seven. <laughs> so start retrieving and practicing the retrieval before we give you more information to retrieve so that you can retrieve in smaller chunks. I have a, just a few comments on that. Uh, as instead of doing a exam autopsy as you do, I actually try to get one-on-one -on -one meetings with the students to actually go over material, but at the same time go over how to actually study and then ask them to, for the spacing is try to utilize your daylight hours uh, so that if you've got an open period between classes, it's fresh in your mind, go and do it right away. Uh, if you're working with groups, if they can get together, do it then, uh, keep doing that. And then because I also tell them that as students, there are many, many other things that you have to do on campus that you want to do. So studying 24 hours a day is not gonna be an option you have to have free time to be a student. And so from that, many of them kind of get the idea of let me 
I need this time management issue. And so that seems to resonate with some of the students itself. Time management is a, is a fairly large issue on our campus. We have, uh, we have many students who are working part-time or full-time jobs and also taking care of children or taking care of uh, other family members. And so it, it's, it's definitely something that comes up very frequently. One thing that we try to do in the Roots of Contemporary Issues program is give a lot of, um, of heads up time so that rather than uh, letting, letting an assessment or something just sit in the syllabus until it happens to be, oops, excuse me, happens to be due that day, we, um, we always spend a little bit of the first part of each day talking about schedule. What's, what's coming up next week? What's coming up the week after? What are some, how might you, um, what should you prioritize in terms of what you're moving through in this class? And so um, I think that's, I hope that's been hopeful for at least some of our students. So. Other thoughts, comments, ideas? Half or? Well, this was, we didn't, I don't, as far as I know, we didn't do any studies on the Pullman campus. And so yeah. the survey That's that you have as a handout was done on the Vancouver campus okay. with um, students that were taking History 105. <clears throat> Is that right, Aaron? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. 105, History 105 and History 305. Okay. And we found that uh, about half of the students who received the book uh, read at least part of it. Okay. Is there anything that you can think of um, to make, not make, but maybe have more students like want to read it um, more instead of just half, you know, get the percent up, or is it just more their right. opinion on it? Well, uh, I, I think as we've all kind of talked about, one of the challenges is that it's difficult to make it a, um, a full requirement for a course because of the way the book is distributed. But what we have done is, uh, made it, a, uh, and I think all, all three of us, have made it a more integral part of what's going on in the class and making it, uh, making the general information from the book very relevant to our specific courses. And I think that if students f see that there are very practical ways that the, the tips in the book relate to what they're doing uh, every week in class, um, I hope that that's going to inspire more of them to read the book uh, and to take some of these uh, tips to heart. Uh, we'll, I guess we'll find out how, how well this works at the end of the term. And I think it would be nice if Pullman, I don't know who, who would do it, but it would be nice if we had some sort of data collection from like similar to what they did in Vancouver, because I would be curious to know what percent of students are reading it and of those, you know, what they think of it. I know that one comment that I heard about um, the book, and actually I heard this from a, another faculty member, was that they, they didn't like the tone of the book because they felt it was sort of condescending or perhaps even insulting. Um, and I think some students, you know, part of when they say, well, it's just common sense, or they say, oh, if I sit in the front row, I'll get better seats, or not. You know, that they're kind of thinking, well, you know, this seems kind of simplistic. And, and so, you know, I think that's maybe something that using it in a positive way can help get over that home. Because I think if you are a little bit cynical, it could be pretty easy to dismiss the, the real gems that are in here if, you know, you feel like you're being talked down to. So I think that's a... I, personally, I like I the book and I like the way that it's, it, the approach is, but I, I can see how it could be a little off-putting for some people. And I found that to be particularly the case with um, students who have had more experience. Uh, they do find the book a bit condescending, something that th the 305 students expressed more than the 105 students. Yeah, yeah I think that data collection is a great idea, and I think we probably could do that through the provost or registrar's office. So. 
So I'm interested, Lisa, since you did incorporate into your first lab this time, what did, how did that seem to go? How did students respond to using that as the practice content for learning how to use Blackboard? And I think you, teaching them how to use Blackboard was really a brilliant idea to yeah. <laughs> say. Yeah, I will say it's sort of self-serving because it saves me a lot of questions. <laughs> Um, well, so that's an excellent question, Karen, and you'd think, having been the one that just said, I think we should do some studies, I actually have not done any assessment <laughs> to see how that first lab went. But, you know, I think maybe the time to do that is after the first exam. So um, I, I'll try to do something about that. I think it would be really useful and interesting to find out what they thought about doing it and if it seemed to help them, you know, engage differently than they might have. I'll do that. I just want to really thank all three presenters for coming. I think you've shared some really great ideas, and we'll continue to pass them on and talk them up. And um, the next one is October 13th. So thank great. you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Oh, and thanks to the AOI team here doing all the work. Planned and